All right, so, so far we've spoken about evolution. We've spoken about the fact that humans have some basic needs. And now I want to take you into a different line of evolution. I want to take you into the evolution of business, right? Which is how did business come about? Why do we do business? Why do we trade with each other, right? And in this video, we're actually going to learn that. And we're going to learn it with some, some illustrations. Okay, so we've already established that humans have some basic needs. And I showed you those needs, those lower order needs and those higher order needs. Success. And let's just talk about success before we, we get into anything. It's a vague term, right? We don't know what successful is. And some people come out and they say, I'm successful because I'm happy. Another person comes out and says, I'm successful because I'm rich. Another person comes out and says, I'm successful because, um, you know, I have children. And, and there are many different markers of success and different people have different ideals for the word success. In my opinion, most people cannot agree on what success really means. So let's focus on the word resource collection, right? I'm going to teach you not how to be successful or anything. I'm going to teach you the concepts behind resource collection, right? So money is a form of an IOU. It's a, it's a marker of contribution. It's like you gave me something. So here's something in return for it. But the event that happens first is you giving somebody something in return for money. It's a way to settle resource score. So let's focus directly on what causes some people to have more resources than others and how companies fight for such resources. And money is one such resource, but actually money is a proxy for other resources. Maybe 500 years ago, the resource in question was gold. Maybe 2000 years ago, the resource in question was copper. Maybe 20,000 years ago, the resource in question was food, right? So resources and which resource is valuable at what given point of time really depends on the environment. Money is just the most generic resource. It can be traded in for other resources. So let's get started. Let's assume we are in this fictional place called the meta world, right? You have the Marvel Cinematic Universe and now you have the meta world that I've invented. So I can show you how this plays out. And this meta world is like a fictional planet, a fictional uh, plane that I've created that you can uh, that we can introduce characters into. We're going to make, we're going to stage a play here. All right. So let's assume there are two people. There's Mr. A and Mr. B, and we've just dropped these people onto the planet, like, or, or the world. Now, I want you to understand that between Mr. A and Mr. B, there has been no connection so far. Maybe Mr. A finds some trees around him, right? And Mr. B finds some potatoes around him. He's you know, he's dug around a little bit and he found potatoes. Maybe he dug with his own bare hands and he found potatoes. Now, Mr. A and B have never come in contact with each other. They don't know each other exist. Uh, Mr. B doesn't know about the existence of trees. Mr. A doesn't know about the existence of potatoes. So the first conditions for trade, and these people haven't traded yet, but if they were to trade, the first condition is they've got to be some resources, right? The next thing is you need the skill to modify these resources, right? So Mr. A has to be able to take these trees and you know, put it together and make a house out of it. So he had, he needs to have some skills and Mr. B needs to be able to improve the ability for him to pull out potatoes. So maybe, you know, he might, uh, you know, put a spade in and pull out potatoes, but here he's not going to do all of that. He's not even going to modify it and make, you know, French fries. He's just going to, you know, sell potatoes as is. Then we have the idea of needs, right? Remember the evolutionary needs we spoke about in the last episode. Now these needs kick in. We know that Mr. A has wood but needs food. Mr. B has food, but needs shelter, right? He needs shelter. So shelter comes under the idea of security, right? Shelter comes in the idea of harm. Like I want to avoid harm. I want to avoid the rains. I want to avoid getting wet. So shelter. Then you need specifically for the idea of trade, you need discoverability, right? You need them to somehow meet each other. Now these two people meet each other. Suppose they're walking about Mr. B sees Mr. A and they're both standing in front of each other one of two things can happen. The first one is a war, right? And I'm talking about long, long time in, in the past. I'm not talking about today, but the first thing that can happen is war for resources, right? And is, you know, it's happened in the past. People fight with each other. Usually they don't fight one-on-one. -on -one. They fight with a lot of people behind them on each side, but there's a war and the winner takes everything. So if Mr. A and B fought a war and Mr. A won, then he'd have the wood and the potatoes, but he'd also carry forward a few injuries. And the difference between human beings and most other animals is our ability to avoid option one, right? Even though we end up sometimes fighting with each other in their wars, uh, 
it is what separates us from most other animals most other animals would get into resource conflict right humans and maybe to a certain extent primates and monkeys are the only ones that collaborate to share resources many other creatures in the animal kingdom but i'm talking about these two in specific the next thing that can happen is trade right mr ray can say look we'll trade um some of my you know houses i can build a house for you for some potatoes in return right so for them to agree on certain terms or for them to even have this negotiation you need the idea of language right so they need to agree on certain terms and if mr a can't speak english and mr b can't speak english there's no point so if mr a is russian and mr b is english then trade doesn't happen right they need to be able to speak the same language and you know earlier in the past one of the main reasons for us to go to war in my opinion was um language barriers people weren't able to express what they wanted and the other side couldn't understand it you have to go down to drawing and rudimentary translations and that never works well right so language is very important because it avoids war it improves the outcomes of trade the next thing that happens is a pricing and negotiation right so mr a can say look you know my houses are hard to build they're harder to build than your potatoes for whatever reason and i think that one house equal to 30 potatoes right so i'll build you a house but i need 30 potatoes in return obviously we're just coming up with you know random numbers maybe a house could cost 500 potatoes but mr a just asked for 30 potatoes because he really wants to eat potatoes if mr a really didn't want to eat potatoes then he might have said you know what it's too much effort to build a house for 30 potatoes i'll give you a house for maybe 500 potatoes because i'm not really interested in potatoes potatoes right now but uh, so i'm going to increase the value of my house with respect to potatoes the next thing that happens is trust assume this transaction happens assume this one house to 30 potatoes transaction happens then the element of trust kicks in which is we've done five transactions before i trust you so it's fine if you pay me later right and that's the thing about human social connections trust increase the speed of trade right when you trust somebody you trade faster there's less negotiation there's less na- language involved right and you kind of already know the other person's need in advance now i'm going to make things hard for these people i'm going to introduce a third person mr c with the same potatoes right mr c has food and he also wants shelter so mr a sorry mr c and mr b they have the same resources and they have the same needs which causes conflict so i'm creating this on purpose conflict right both of them suppose they both discovered mr a and mr b is already working with mr a mr c comes in and says i'm selling you the same thing mr a has to choose between c and b because they're essentially selling the same things so what happens is mr a says i reject you mr c i don't want to work with you i'm already working with mr b and i have the trust right and this is where the first mover advantage comes in right so if you're a company and you invent something new and you're working with many other companies uh um, even if another company comes in doing exactly what you're doing uh the other companies are less likely to go with company b because you've already built the trust with them right so being first mover allows you more than anything to build trust right so mr c is rejected he feels really bad about it so he has two options the first option is find somebody else who can sell me shelter and who wants food the two preconditions a i really need shelter and b who wants my things who wants my food or i go work for mr b because i can create potatoes i mean i can pull out potatoes from the ground i've also found potatoes mr b is anyway getting the deal flow from mr a they've already built a relationship i might as well go and work for mr b right so he decides to go and work for mr b so mr c decides to work for mr b and this is exactly how jobs work right so the somebody is doing trade and instead of you directly doing trade you are indirectly doing trade by working for somebody else who is directly doing trade and this is the origin of jobs in 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 a management theory right so say mr b and mr c have a fight right because mr c says you know what i'm helping you get the potatoes the only thing you have the only advantage you have over me is that you discovered mr a first you built the trust first but you're paying me only maybe 10% of the revenues whereas you know i'm also getting the potatoes i'm doing all the hard work so maybe they they have an argument right so mr c takes a flight outside and as you can see in the bottom you know there's a flight with mr c he leaves this first meta world with mr a and b and he finds another meta world mr d and e right and mr d and e both have houses both have wood so mr c has found a new market 
right? And one of the biggest advantages with finding a new market is, uh, in in this case especially, is Mr. C has multiple different people who have wood and who want potatoes. So markets are really important because, you know, maybe in Asia, something sells well, but in America, it won't sell so well, or you are looking for a different resource. And for example, when I was selling t-shirts when I was young, Manipal had no t-shirt suppliers, right? There was one and it was very expensive, about 450 rupees a t-shirt. But when I took a bus and went to Tirupur, uh, which is, you know, placed in Chennai, I found many different t-shirt suppliers, right? And the average price of t-shirt suppliers, there was 200, 250 rupees per t-shirt. And then, you know, some, now it's even cheaper because more t-shirt providers have entered the market. So the more people there are that create something, the effective price lowers. It's called a correction, right? Which is why Mr. C in this case decided to just quote and go to a place where his where there is less competition, where his where his what he's selling is being absorbed by the people. But in this case, there's no concept of money. So he actually needs two preconditions. One, he needs to be able to sell his potatoes. And two, he needs to be able to find people with wood, right? Whereas in the concept of money, you only need to focus on what you're selling. You don't need to focus on what you're buying because money can translate into anything else. That's the real advantage of money. It's a proxy, right? So he starts doing trade with Mr. D and E. And as you can see, the location matters. The market or the location matters. So Mr. B is king in his market. Mr. C is king in his. And, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lot about markets if you go and watch these old movies about mafia dons and how they mark their territories. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing, right? It's where I do my business. Please don't come and do business where I do my business. And there is a relationship. Mr. B and Mr. C can still form a relationship and say, Mr. B can say, Hey, Mr. C, don't come here. And Mr. C can say, Mr. B, don't come here. And we have an agreement on that. So you can still be friends while being in different locations while competing. Competitors can be friends as long as they choose different markets. Now, the world is complex, right? And like I spoke before, it's not a meta world. They're not like one or two characters doing, you know, transactions between one or two resources. The world has so many different people selling each other solutions for their needs. And it's a big crisscross. I could be buying from five different suppliers. You could be buying from 30 different suppliers and I could still sell to you. And money is the medium by which all of this happens because otherwise I need to look specifically for people who are selling me what I need. If I need computer parts, I need to look for the one guy who's selling me computer parts. And then maybe that guy only wants chicken. And I'm like, I don't have chicken, right? So, which is why it money allows me to first be able to sell my skills. Maybe I'm a good um, business guy or, or maybe I'm a good uh, potato seller and I sell a lot of potatoes and I make money. Then I can go give it to the computer guy because I can say, look, I'm going to give you money. You go buy how many of a chicken you need to buy. All right. So that's the advantage of money. It prevents you from having to carry around things that other people need in specific. You can just carry money, which is a proxy and they can use it however they want to. So the world is very complex and the internet is actually restricting space. Right? Because until now, location has always been a barrier. Right? You, it was hard for you to find something in India. You know, I remember the times when I was, I think, about 10 or 12 years old and I was sitting um, in a hallway in Mumbai, in a mall in Mumbai, and my mom was there and I was just, I saw this, this, this board of a McDonald's coming up. Right? So there was a board saying the first Indian McDonald's is coming up. And I looked at that and I got really excited and I was like, because I'd heard about the Happy Meal. Right? And for the first time it coming up in India, I was like, wow, that's awesome. Right. But today we have a McDonald's everywhere. Right. And every major brand has now found an easy way to expand because of the internet. Right. If I'm selling software earlier, you could only sell software to the people around you. Right. In, in the same city or in the same country. But now it's gotten to a point where you can sell software to anybody at any time, anywhere. Instead of a lot of trade happening between a lot of people, a lot of trade is happening between a few people. You know, there are a lot of lines into one or two people, and then there are a lot, those people are not spending too much. So the internet is restricting space. It's causing competition again. It's causing a lot of conflict. It's causing a lot of resource wars. So, you know, this is something where I don't have an actual solution to this. This is a problem we'll have to figure out as a team, as a, as a, as a country, as a, as a nation, as a, as a world. Um, but yeah, this is happening right now. And all the people who are giving you career advice are not realizing this. This is the biggest change in business, which is why if somebody is not well versed with the internet, you shouldn't probably take too much advice from them because the internet changes one major part of that entire um, stack that I spoke about the entire, you know, location stack. And because of that, everything has changed, right? So the internet has brought us closer together, but there's too many people 
there's too little space, there's skewed demand and supply and menial tasks are being automated. So that case of Mr. C working for Mr. B, because Mr. B now has robots, he doesn't need Mr. C to pull out potatoes from under the ground. So Mr. B is able to do away with Mr. C, in which case Mr. C has only one option, which is to leave the market, right? And go to another market. But with the internet, all the markets are the same. They're all under one roof. So Mr. C has nowhere to go. Mr. C is fun functionally unemployed, even though he has an actual skill of being able to pull out potatoes. The only disadvantage is he didn't have the discoverability. He didn't have the ability to go out and reach out to a buyer and, and build trust. So innovation becomes important. Mr. C has to find something new to sell Mr. A or Mr. B if he wants to survive, right? So the essential conditions for trade, I'm going to repeat this one more time, resources, the skills to modify resources, somebody's needs, discoverability, communication, pricing and negotiation, trust, location, right? So in all of this, the government's role, and people think, you know, it's the government's role to create jobs. It's not, right? They, they have no role in this. They just have to make sure that innovation is stimulated. They have to keep it fair. They have to make sure one person is not outright lying to everybody and stealing their money. They have to prevent monopolies and antitrust. I'm not going to get into what that is, but they have to prevent one guy from owning an entire market, right? Because that, that creates... I mean, you can set whatever price you want, right? If you're the only guy selling potatoes in a market, you can set whatever price you want. And the government's role is to make sure there's at least one or two other guys selling potatoes so that the market corrects and normalizes so that people have another person or another seller to go to if this one seller is overpricing them. Finally, making it easy for people to transact. I wrote transaction because, you know, I wasn't paying attention, but for people to transact, you have to make it easier for people to transact so they're able to buy quicker or sell quicker instead of going through a lot of hoops. Right? So it's entrepreneurs that really create jobs, not government. It's the Mr. A or the Mr. B who goes out, gets the discoverability, builds the trust, comes up with the in initial idea, pulls out the potatoes from the ground or builds that software, whatever. And, you know, I'm not going to say that everyone watching this has to be an entrepreneur because it is an incredibly risky task. You don't know which of your products is going to be taken in by the market. It takes time to build those products, but you can help entrepreneurs in good ways. When you join a company like Zomato, when you join a company like Apple, or when you join any other company, you're actually helping the CEO or the entrepreneurs who are leading the company. Uh, you're actually just helping them, right? It's, it's not like you're joining a company. The company at the end of the day is composed of people and certain people in the company make decisions. Usually the people at the top make the decision. So actually you're just helping those people at the top, right? So, and you can help in many ways. For example, when you're a graphic designer, what are you helping with? Right. Let's go back and let's see what, what does a graphic designer help with. And you see that the graphic designer can help with discoverability. Right. You can make the product more visible. Right. When somebody's scrolling through their feed and an ad is being run. If you are a good graphic designer, you can get your point across better discoverability, better communication. Right. So when you're negotiating, um, if you are a good graphic designer, you can create a better proposal. So the other person understands better what you're saying or what you're proposing. It helps with pricing and negotiation too. So you can help in multiple parts of the stack. At the end of the day, it's still about these basic things. And you should see where you can add value. Everything from graphic design to writing code, um, all of it affects some parts of the stack. In fact, you won't believe it, but writing code actually helps with the location, right? Writing code allows you to be location less. It allows you to play in this crowded market, right? Which is why I really suggest people to write code because it's getting compressed and you're still, you know, you're, you're not, you're not involved in this game. So, which is why I think that you will be left out, which is, you know, I don't want to fear monger, but coding is one of the most important skills you can learn right now as the market gets more compressed. So at the end of the day, it's entrepreneurs that create jobs or you can help an entrepreneur do what he or she is trying to do, right? Those are the two options that you have. And one is called, you know, actually starting a company. The other one is called having a job and helping somebody start a company or run a company. So that's about it. In the next episode, we'll learn a little more about where management is leading us.